Okay, I think we'll let people continue to trickle in, uh, but we'll get going. Lots and lots of bird species to cover. So again, thank you all for joining us tonight. It is really fantastic to uh, to see so many people are interested in finding out more about the birds. And uh, just out of curiosity, if you heard about this on the radio, can you let us know in the chat? Because we were super excited to uh, get our, get an interview with On The Go today. So uh, we're just curious to know, did people actually hear about this on the radio? Um, for those of you who haven't met me, some of you were here last week, but for those of you who haven't met me, I'm Catherine Dale, and I am the coordinator of the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas. And with us today uh, is my colleague, Jenna McDermott, uh, who currently uh, looks like Birds Canada Atlantic. That's her name on the screen. Um, so she is the assistant coordinator of the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas. Um, and so both of us work for an organization called Birds Canada. And I just want to tell you a little bit about Birds Canada, if you're not familiar. Um, Birds Canada, our slogan is that we are your voice for birds or Canada's voice for birds. Uh, we're the leading science-based bird conservation organization in the country. And our mission is to advance the understanding, appreciation, and conservation of Canada's wild birds and their habitats. Uh, it's a big goal. And mostly how we do that is uh, through programs that engage the skills and support of our members and our staff, but also volunteers. So we have a lot of citizen sci science programs. Um, and actually it's kind of mind boggling that uh, every year more than 70,000 volunteers nationwide participate in Birds Canada's uh, citizen science program. So really we could not do what we do without you. Here in Newfoundland, we are relative newcomers. Uh, so we have only been active in Newfoundland and Labrador since 2019. Um, and we run two programs here. And the big one, and the one that you'll hear a lot about through this series is the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas. Uh, we have a whole presentation just dedicated to the atlas. So I'm not gonna go into it in great detail today, but basically what it is, is an, a citizen science effort to map the distribution and abundance of all of the species of birds that breed on the island of Newfoundland. Um, so this map here is our current map for the Atlantic Puffin, uh, obviously our logo seabird here. Um, and you can see all of these little squares. The gray ones are places where people have looked for the bird and not found it. Not surprisingly, puffins are not breeding in the middle of the island. Uh, and then the red squares show where we know for sure they're breeding. So that would be Whitless Bay. Uh, this is probably the Bacaloo area. Uh, no, Bacaloo's down here. Um, this is just off Bonavista, right? This is the Bonavista Lighthouse. And here we have some orange, uh, which is probable breeding. Um, so that's what we're trying to do for all of the species of birds that breed on the island. And the other project that we run here is called the Atlantic Nocturnal Owl Survey. Um, this is just, it's a much, uh, it's a much more constrained project. Basically what it involves is volunteers going out for one night between the 1st of April and the 15th of May. Uh, they go out and they survey a predetermined route of 10 stops for owls. Uh, and we don't have that many species of nocturnal owls here, so it's actually really er easy to learn what it is you're listening for. Um, and it's a really great survey for beginner birders. So we are always looking for volunteers who are interested in participating in both of these surveys, both of these programs. Uh, so at any time, if you want to sign up to volunteer, you can contact us. Uh, our contact information will be at the end of the presentation. Um, by email, or you can go on to our website and find out how you can sign up there. And finally, just before we go into uh, the presentation, I just wanted to take a moment to thank all of our partners and funders. Um, a Breeding Bird Atlas is a huge endeavor, and certainly it would not be possible to do this without the help of all of these organizations. Uh, and they also help us by providing time and uh, resources for workshops like this. Okay, so today we are talking about seabirds, and obviously this is a big topic to cover here in Newfoundland. Uh, so just a little outline, we're going to talk, first of all, what do I mean when I say seabird? Uh, we're going to talk about Newfoundland and seabirds, and then we are going to go through these seabird families and talk about the species of birds that are found breeding here in Newfoundland. And I do say breeding um, because obviously with our interest in the atlas, we're really just focusing on that one season. Um, it can be a little bit overwhelming when you start covering all of the species of birds that are found in Newfoundland at every time of year. So it felt like a good way to break off a chunk to focus on our breeding bird species. So what is a seabird? Uh, turns out it's not actually a formal scientific bird or, or group of birds. You won't actually find seabirds as a chunk in your bird guide. 
Um, and scientists can't actually agree on which bird families should be included in the definition, which isn't all that surprising because scientists don't agree on lots of things. Um, so I really like this little quote here. Uh, there, the one common characteristic that all seabirds share is that they feed in salt water, but as seems to be true with any statement in biology, some don't. Um, so there are lots of birds that use saltwater habitat, but aren't considered true seabirds. So things like loons, grebes, sea ducks, herons, shorebirds, um, we wouldn't consider them seabirds. What we can say about seabirds is they are groups for, they're the group of birds that make their living primarily from the ocean. Um, and they're really well adapted to do this. So they've got dense waterproof feathers and layers of fat. Uh, they have a desalination system. So many of them drink salt water. So they have to find some way to remove that excess salt. Um, they have webbed feet, very useful in water. And they have, there's a variety of body shapes, but the body shape tells you a lot about their lifestyle. Uh, so for example, you've got these little short wings and chunky bodies uh, like our puffin here. Those are not great for flying long distances, but they're really good for diving um, in cold Northern waters. So puffins do really well. They're great divers. They're, uh, they're very good in the cold waters. Whereas if you've got something like an albatross or a shearwater, you've got these long slender wings. Um, they're very good at traveling long distances and collecting prey from the ocean surface, and they tend to be good in uh, warmer waters, although we do have a shearwater species, uh, or sorry, a fulmer species today that we'll be covering here. Um, seabirds are long-lived, and this is quite different from many other species of birds. Some actually may live over 50 years, and a really well-known example is Wisdom, who is a Lazen albatross and is the world's oldest known banded bird. Uh, she's more than 70 years old now. Um, so, you know, in, in some cases, seabird lifespans can actually be quite similar to human lifespans, which is pretty mind boggling. Um, as part of this, they have delayed breeding. So most bird species, at least the smaller songbirds, you'll find that they uh, are hatched one summer and by the next breeding season, they are breeding. Seabirds often don't breed until five to 10 years of age. Um, so that is that is a significant delay when compared with a lot of other bird species. And this long life and delayed breeding, it may actually be an evolutionary adaptation for life in the ocean because the ocean is very variable. Um, and so they may need some time to figure out how to forage prey in different seasons. And they also want that being long lived also helps them because they have many chances to try and successfully reproduce. Uh, and seabirds generally tend to have fewer chicks than something like songbirds. Um, so songbirds will often have five or six eggs in a clutch. That's un unusual in seabirds. Um, so I said today that I was excited to talk about Newfoundland seabirds. Uh, many of you may know that Newfoundland is known as the seabird capital of North America. Um, that photo there is of one of my absolute favorite places on this island, that's Cape St. Mary's. And you can just see uh, bird rock there covered in northern gannets. Uh, so here we have 29,000 kilometers of coast, coastline, and it provides essential habitat for more than 35 million seabirds. Um, we have the largest colony of leeches storm petrels in the world, which is more than 3 million breeding pairs. And we have the largest colony of Atlantic puffins in North America, which is more than 300,000 breeding pairs. So seabirds are, are a big part of Newfoundland's culture. Um, and in fact, six of the province's wilderness and ecological reserves are designated as reserves, particularly because of seabirds. So you can see, it's very hard to read this map, but you can see all of these blue reserves. These are seabird reserves. Um, so uh, you'll notice here the Whitless Bay Islands, that's where uh, the, the puffin colony is. You'll notice Bakalu, that's where the largest colony of storm petrels uh, is, and Cape St. Mary is down here, uh, which is where, where the gannets are, among other seabirds. Uh, so we really do have some pretty amazing islands here. Sorry, Catherine, I'm just going to jump in super quickly, and I, because I can't see where you're pointing on the screen, so just oh. um, when you're saying here and there, um, you might want to... Um, that is useful to know. Yes. Yep. Sorry. I just assumed you could see my cursor. Thank you, Jenna. <laughs> no uh, okay. I will have to be a little more descriptive. Yes. Hmm. All right. Well, Whitless Bay is uh, second from the bottom here. So you can see that colony right along the edge of the Avalon. And Cape St. Mary's is one of the bottom uh, three on the left there. And I will try not to use my cursor anymore. Thank you for the heads up, Jenna. 
Okay, so these are the groups of seabirds that we are going to cover today. Uh, as I said, we are focusing on species that breed here. Um, this is particularly important for seabirds because, frankly, seabirds that don't breed here, you're unlikely to see them unless you're out on the water. Uh, because seabirds really tend to only come to land during the breeding season. Otherwise, they stay away from land. Um, the only two species that we're just going to briefly talk about uh, that don't breed here are those ones shown in gray there, the Wilson storm petrel and the dovekey. So let's start with our northern fulmer. Uh, at first glance, you might think that this is a gull. Um, that's what I thought when I first looked at it. Uh, so it belongs to the family Procellariformes, which also includes albatrosses and petrels. So some of the things that are different about this bird that, that uh, separate it from a gull, um, it's the big thing is if you look very closely at the bill there, uh, you will see that it has a little tube on top of its bill. So Procellariformes actually means tube noses. Uh, their nostrils are enclosed in tubes on a straight bill with a little hooked tip. Um, and this we think contributes to their highly developed sense of smell. Um, these birds are really good at finding prey on the ocean's surface. And then they have the hooked tip on the bill that allows them to hold on to slightly slippery things like fish and squid. Um, they drink seawater, these guys, and they excrete salt through nasal glands at the base of the bill. Uh, so it actually drips out of the bill. Um, the big difference between them and the gulls, as I said, is that tube nose. There's also a difference in the flight pattern if you, if you spend time watching them fly. Um, so gulls have slower, looser wing, uh, wing beats, whereas fulmers fly with very stiff wing beats. And uh, according to one description, they fly like tanks. So you'll see that they are quite a stocky bird. Um, so yeah, there's the tube nose. There's, that's your classic IDQ. Uh, other things you're looking for, those stiff, straight wings, a very thick neck. Uh, they, they do, they, they're quite a bulky bird. They have a dark smudge around the eye and a short, thick, yellowish bill and a short gray tail. However, just to make things a little trickier, it is worth noting that there are multiple color morphs of the vulner. Uh, so they can actually vary in color from dark gray to nearly white. So this is a dark morph, northern fulmer. Um, northern fulmers are opportunistic feeders. So you'll often see them scavenging uh, discards from fishing boats. And we actually think that the growth of the com commercial fishery may have played a role in their range expansion. So they used to have a much smaller range um, and they were actually only first recorded breeding in Newfoundland in the 1960s, uh, but they are now common year round. So they breed on steep ocean cliffs and colonies. Um, and some of our colonies are at Whitless Bay where the puffins are and uh, Cape St. Mary's and the Funk Islands. Um, and I should note that this map only shows North America, but the distribution of the Northern Fulmer is actually uh, worldwide. Okay, on to our next procellariform. form. Uh, the leeches storm petrel, and this may be the most common seabird that you've never heard of or seen. Uh, so they are the most abundant seabird in eastern Canada, but they spend pretty much their entire lives out at sea, except for breeding. And when they breed, you still don't see them super often because they nest in burrows, uh, and they only come to and from those burrows at night in the dark to avoid predators. These guys are pretty small. They're about the size of a robin, so they're actually the smallest member of the tube nose family. They weigh under 50 grams. But what's kind of mind boggling about these guys is they actually travel up to 1200 kilometers offshore to find food during the breeding season. So that is a hell of a commute. Uh, so IDQs for the, the leeches storm petrel, which I should note is the only storm petrel that breeds here. Um, you can see all on the wing there, it, you've got what it's called a pale carpal bar. So that white smudge that reaches all the way to the leading edge of the wing. Uh, they do have a tube nose. You have to look pretty closely to see it, but it's there. They have quite short legs that are not visible past the end of the tail. And that's important when comparing them with, our, with the other storm petrel you might see around, which is the Wilson storm petrel. Um, they have a long tail, but it has a notch in it. Uh, and they have long angled arched wings and that white uh, band on the rump there you can see. So when you compare them to the Wilson storm petrel, uh, it's easy, to me, one of the, the easiest things to see on storm petrels is that white band on the rump, but you can see that that's not gonna help you distinguish between these two species. Uh, so what you wanna look at when you're trying to figure out uh, if it's a leech storm petrel or a Wilson storm petrel, 
Um, first of all, you can note that the carpal bar doesn't go all the way to the edge of the wing in the Wilson storm petrel. The tail, instead of that notch that you see on the leech's storm petrel, is actually square. So that's a really good cue. And Wilson storm petrels have longer legs, so they actually extend past the base of the tail. Um, so that is an excellent cue. Uh, leech's storm petrels do actually have longer wings than Wilson storm petrels, and th those wings are more arched when they're flying. But those type of comparisons cues aren't necessarily helpful unless you happen to have both a leech's storm petrel and a Wilson storm petrel flying together, which, you know, you can't count on them to be that useful, that helpful to you. Um, however, you probably don't have to worry too much about uh, distinguishing between Wilson storm petrel and leech's storm petrel because Wilson storm petrels actually breed all the way down in, in Antarctica. Um, and then they actually come and they spend the Southern hemisphere winter, so our summer up here. Um, so you'll rarely see them close to land once they travel away from the breeding grounds, because as I said, seabirds mostly spend their time at sea unless they're breeding. Uh, so if you see storm petrels on land in Newfoundland, it's probably a leech's storm petrel. Um, and I just wanted to take a moment here to divert a bit from our description of seabirds and talk a little bit more about storm petrels. Uh, because I mentioned that Newfoundland is home to the largest breeding colony of leeches storm petrels in the world on Bakaloo Island, just off the Avalon Peninsula. Um, and in fact, colonies in Newfoundland, we, we hear we may actually be as home, home to as much as 50% of the global population of, storm, of leeches storm petrels. So we have a lot of responsibility for uh, the health of the species. So in 1985, uh, on Bakaloo, this large colony hosted a population of 6.6 .6 million birds. Um, and then at nearby colonies in Whitless Bay, there were about another 1.4 million birds. However, when they came back and surveyed those same colonies 20 to 30 years later, what they found is a 40 to 50% population decline. So this basically means there are 3.3 million storm petrels that have disappeared just at these colonies alone. Um, and other research has shown that the species breeding populations are plummeting elsewhere across the Atlantic. And so we're trying to figure out why that might be. And what we've determined so far is that the survival of chicks is actually very high. Almost 100% of chicks survive to leave the burrow. But adult survival for, is very low, at least for a seabird, it's very low. So we're looking about 80%. Um, and so there are four hypotheses as to why this might be the case. Uh, sorry, this is just a figure showing you the population decline here. I realized that I had a graph that might be useful. Um, so four hypotheses explaining what is going on with these storm petrels. Uh, the first is that they might be experiencing predation in burrows, but that's unlikely to be the issue because chick survival is so high. And it's, you know, chicks you would expect uh, would be experiencing predation as well. Um, it could be a lack of food resources. We know that as temperatures change in the ocean, we're seeing changes in the distribution of prey populations. So that could be the issue. Um, it could also be pollution. So uh, leech storm petrels have been shown to be quite high in mercury. Um, plastic particles might also be an issue for them. And another hypothesis is it might be artificial light attraction. So we know that um, petrels are, as, as well as other seabirds, are attracted to light. Uh, and even um, things like offshore oil platforms, which uh, are very, very bright, might actually be, um, be drawing in the petrels. And obviously, it's not entirely safe for them to be flying close to oil platforms. Uh, so this is currently being researched by several groups in North America, including uh, members of Bill Montebecki's lab at MUN. Um, and if you're interested in learning a bit more about storm petrels and what's going on with them and what we know, there are a couple of talks from in the fall that you can find on our website. Uh, so Laura Tranquilla gave us an overview of uh, petrel research in North America or Atlantic Canada. And uh, Sydney Collins gave us a talk about the light attraction issue specifically and the behavior of petrels around uh, the offshore rigs. So you can have a look at those. The videos are available. Okay, moving on from our tube noses, we will move on to the northern gannet. And this may be one of our most recognizable birds here. Uh, anybody who's been to Cape St. Mary's has seen these guys. These are the largest breeding seabirds in the North Atlantic, and they are gorgeous birds. Um, there's not too much you can mistake an adult with. Uh, you've got that yellowish head, you've got a 
dagger-like bill, white primaries, and dark black wingtips. So they're pretty distinct birds. Um, and they travel really long distances to forage. So they're a common sight all along the coasts of Newfoundland, even though uh, we have three specific colonies here. Um, so uh, in fact, there are six in, um, in North America, so three in the Gulf of St. Lawrence and three along the coast of Newfoundland and Labrador. Cape St. Mary's at the, the bottom of the Avalon is the southernmost colony of gannets and the most accessible. And it has about 30,000 birds. And uh, if you haven't been there and you happen to be on the island, I would highly recommend it. One of the coolest things I think about gannets is how they feed. They perform these precision dives. Uh, they hit the ocean at about 100 kilometers an hour like torpedoes. Uh, and amazingly, they will sort of dive right beside each other, and it, I haven't seen anybody get hurt, so it's quite mind-boggling. Something you do need to watch out uh, with gannets, um, the adults are quite difficult to mistake, but the juveniles and immatures can be a little bit trickier because they start out dark and they become white over a period of four to five years. Um, so a few years ago, a birder spotted um, another seabird, a very unusual seabird, a brown booby down at Cape St. Mary's. And at first, um, a lot of birders weren't quite sure whether or not to get excited because they wondered if maybe he might have just spotted an immature gannet. Uh, so you really need to watch out for these darker colored juveniles. Okay, and moving on to possibly the one of the most hated birds in the world. Uh, so these guys have a little bit of a reputation issue. They're known as the shag in Newfoundland. Uh, the name is the double-crested cormorant. Uh, people tend to dislike them because they eat a lot of fish and they're not necessarily the most attractive birds, but I think when you take a good, good up-close look at them, they're pretty cool. Um, so they've got a nice long neck, that S-shaped neck, They've got a black throat, orange at the base of the bill, and blue eyes, and they have a nice hooked bill, again, very useful for holding on to slippery prey. Um, they have black feathers with a green or bronze sheen, and they have a long tail. And this guy here is doing what's known as wing spreading, um, and this is a technique they use to dry their feathers after swimming because they don't actually have waterproof feathers, unlike a lot of other seabirds. So they have less prenoil than other birds and their feathers get soaked rather than shedding water like a duck's. Um, this may actually make it easier for them to hunt underwater, but it does mean they need to dry themselves off when they, when they get out of the water. We do actually have a second species of cormorant here in Newfoundland, um, and that is the great cormorant. So again, very similar in shape to the double-crested cormorant. Uh, it is actually bigger than the double-crested cormorant, but again, that is really only a useful ID feature if you happen to have the two species beside each other. Um, however, I'm sure that you guys can spot one big difference right away, and that is the white cheeks and throat, which is quite distinct from the, the black throat that you see on a double-crested cormorant. Um, they also have white flank patches, which are seen in flight, but you can't actually see the, that white in this picture. Um, so if you've got what looks like a double-crested cormorant, but you're seeing more white, then probably you are seeing a great cormorant. Um, double-crested cormorants also have, you probably wonder where they get their name. I did for years too. They have these little tufts that you can see in that picture there on either side of their head when they're breeding. So that's their crests. Uh, but that's, those are often very difficult to see. Um, so it's not maybe the most useful ID feature. Um, it's worth knowing though that here in Newfoundland, uh, great cormorants are much less common. Uh, Double-crested cormorants are much more common and they're also the only ones that you are likely to see inland away from the coast. So if you're in central Newfoundland and you see a cormorant, it's most likely to be a double-crested cormorant. Okay, now we are moving into a totally different family, the ox. So these are the bir birds of the family Alcidae. Um, this is the same family as the extinct great auk, and superficially they're quite similar to penguins. So they are black and white in color, and they've got that upright posture that you think of when you think of penguins. However, one big difference, all of our extant auks fly. Um, so this is the common murr, uh, known as the tur in Newfoundland, and it nests in colonies on steep cliffs. Uh, so this picture was actually taken at Cape St. Mary's because they are another common breeder there. Um, and so with these guys, you see that they have a nice long thin bill. They've got that upright stance that marks them as an alcid. 
They've got a white breast and belly, and then a black brown head, neck, back, wings. So white underneath, black on top. And then they've got that line of white tips on their wing feathers. So you see that thin white line on the wing. We do actually have two species of myrrh here, both of which have no, are known as turs here in Newfoundland. Uh, so this is our second species, the thick-billed myrrh. Um, and the easiest way to tell them apart from the common myrrh is that little milk mustache you can see there. So they've got a white line on the upper bill. Um, the other way you can tell a difference is by looking at where the white on the breast meets, uh, meets the black of the neck. So on common myrrhs, you get more of a gentle rounding meaning, whereas on thick-billed myrrhs, you get a sharp point. So I just said we have two species of myrrhs here. Who is this? Uh, you're probably thinking, I don't remember you mentioning anything about myrrhs with a nice uh, white line around their eye. So this is actually a common myrrh. This is a bridled common myrrh. So one of the really cool things about common myrrhs is that they are dimorphic in the Atlantic. So we have these two different forms. We have the bridled and the unbridled. Um, and it seems that the bridling, that, that white circle around the eye and the white line down the head, that seems to be recessive, but it also seems to be associated with cold adaptation, which is really neat. So the frequency of bridled birds at a colony correlates with sea surface temperature. So when you are in colder water, you get more of the birds that have that bridal. And in warmer water, you get uh, fewer birds that have the bridal. And when they look at how those birds survive, they find that uh, survival increases in the warmer waters for the birds that aren't bridled. And in colder waters, you see the opposite. Bridled birds survive better. So it looks like that bridling is somehow related to uh, temperature adaptation and cold adaptation. And I actually uh, have a friend from when I went to grad school who studied the genetics of bridling and thermal adaptation in common MERS. And she found that the genes for that bridal, it's a very simple uh, genetic dimorphism, and it was very closely uh, located to a gene that seemed to control temperature adaptation. So there is some genetic evidence that these things are related. Um, so just keep in mind, the, the thick-billed myrrhs are the ones with the milk mustache, and then when you have common myrrhs, you can have bridled and unbridled. Uh, this guy is another alcid, so you can see the same color pattern. You've got the white breast and the dark back. Uh, it is one of my favorite Newfoundland seabirds. Uh, it's a razor bill. Um, it is called a tinker here in Newfoundland, which is a local pronunciation of thinker. Um, and this is because during courtship, uh, razor bills will hold their bills vertically, so they'll look straight up at the sky, and it looks like they are contemplating the heavens, so they are known locally as thinkers or tinkers. Um, so these are stockier bills, than, or stockier birds than the MERS, uh, and obviously the bill is considerably larger than the, the thin pointed bill of the MER. Um, it also has these white markings on it, so while in the thick billed MER you've got the white marking on sort of the upper bill, here you've got a horizontal white line from the eye to the base of the bill, and then a vertical white line at the tip of the bill. Um, you've got that same line of white tips on the secondary wing feathers, and then, as I said, the black upper parts and the white breast and belly. Okay, and another auk. Uh, this is our smallest breeding auk, and it is known as the sea pigeon here. Um, so you see the same color palette again, the black and white. Um, but in this case, you've got black, both back and, and belly, and then you've got those white wing patches. Um, and then you've got one noticeable difference. You've got a big splash of color here, and that is the bright red feet. So I love these guys also. Uh, they nest on rocky coastlines, and the colonies can get pretty big, particularly in the Arctic. Uh, so cues for these, they're smaller ox. Uh, they've got the black back with white wing patches red feet and legs, and if you happen to see them open their mouths, it turns out that the inside of their mouths actually matches their feet, so you've got bright red uh, on the inside of their mouths, um, and then you've got a thin, sharp bell and a black breast and belly. Um, if you see these guys in the water, you can usually see those bright red feet paddling underwater, so it's a, it's a very diagnostic cue. Okay, and another auk that really needs no introduction because this is our most iconic bird here in Newfoundland, uh, also known as the sea parrot and the hatchet face. It is an Atlantic puffin. So as I said earlier, Newfoundland is home to the biggest breeding uh, colony in North America. 
half of North America's Atlantic puffin population is found in Whitless Bay. Um, and as some of you may know, like storm petrels, these guys uh, actually do nest in burrows. And they also experience problems with attraction to artificial light. So when they emerge from their burrows, uh, pufflings, which is what we call the, the young puffins, they are supposed to head out to sea. They're supposed to follow the moon out to sea. However, um, as coastal communities get brighter and brighter, many of them are actually going in the wrong way. Um, and this is why we have an organization or an initiative here in Newfoundland called the Puffin Patrol, which is run by the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society. Um, and they go around during the fledging time for Atlantic puffins. So in August, they have volunteers go around at night scooping up the baby pufflings that have gone the wrong way and found themselves stranded on the roads of these coastal communities. Uh, so you don't really need too many IDQs for an Atlantic puffin because really there's not much else like it here. Uh, there are in fact three puffin species, the horned, the tufted, and the Atlantic, but the other two species are found only in the Pacific. So here, if it's a puffin, it's an Atlantic puffin. Um, so for these guys, you've got the black upper parts again and the white underparts. You've got short, straight wings. They're quite a bulky bird when you see them flying. They look a little bit like a potato with wings. They have orange legs, and then they've got that extremely colorful parrot-like bill. Uh, but note that in the winter, that bill loses its sort of outer colorful plates, and it becomes less triangular shaped and, and shrinks slightly. So that's really a breeding cue. Um, the face becomes grayer in the winter, and juveniles have all dark bills. Um, so puffins are, they're, they're pretty amazing birds. As I said, they're pretty cool uh, to see flying if you ever get the chance, um, and they fly with very rapid wing beats, so 300 to 400 beats per minute, and I can't get over the fact that they really just look like flying potatoes. They're pretty fantastic birds. Okay, and the last of our ox that I'm going to talk about here is the smallest of the alcids, but it's also the most abundant in the North Atlantic, um, and these guys are a little bit um, pot-bellied, might be a good way to describe it, uh, and in fact, um, Cornell University's website, All About Birds, it describes them as flying billiard balls with whirring wings. Uh, so very small, very small bill there, uh, but you see the same color scheme as the other alcids, so the white underneath and the dark on back. However, that is not what a dove key that you see in Newfoundland would look like. So if you were to come across a dove key in Newfoundland, it would look quite different. You still got the dark back and the white underneath, but you can see that big white patch extending up on the cheek there. Um, and this is because dove keys don't actually breed in Newfoundland. As you can see from the distribution map, they actually breed much further north. Uh, we only see them here in the winter in our waters uh, where they look like this picture here. Uh, so the cues you're looking for here, they are very small. Uh, they've got little short bills. They essentially have no neck whatsoever. Um, you've got white underparts and, and cheek, very, very short tail, black upper parts. Um, and here in Newfoundland, they are known as the bull bird, probably because they have no neck. Okay, so now we are going to uh, switch gears a little bit and we're going to talk about gulls and terns. Um, and so, as I said, we are again focusing on those species that breed here. Uh, so, we are only going to talk about five species of gulls today and uh, three species of terns. Now, I slight disclaimer, in the winter here in Newfoundland, we have all kinds of gull species, and it's far more complicated than we really have time to get into today. Um, because gulls, they vary plumage immensely, whether, depending on whether they are juvenile or immature. Um, so as they age, they change plumage between winter and summer. So you have all kinds of complicated stuff like a second year uh, winter plumage of a gull. Um, if you're interested, Nature NL um, often does a winter gull workshop. I'm not sure if they're offering it this year, uh, but I believe that they are planning to put a video of last year's workshop up on their website for members. Uh, so you might be able to check that out. And they do a fantastic job of discussing winter gulls, which uh, as I said, we're not gonna get into today. So the first gull I wanna talk about, known here as the tickle ace, um, and it is the black-legged kittiwake. Uh, very small gull, very cute gull. It's the third species that breeds in large numbers at Cape St. Mary's. 
Um, and unlike what we tend to think of when we think about gulls, these guys don't scavenge food and forage a dump, so you're not likely to see them in the parking lot at McDonald's. Uh, rather, they eat mostly small fish and marine invertebrates. Um, and you can see that picture was actually taken at Cape St. Mary's because you can see the, uh, the little kittiwake chicks underneath the adult there. So ID cues for these guys, you've got a narrow pointed yellow green bill, light gray wings and back, and then those dark black wingtips. And as you might guess from the name, the black leg kitty wake, they do have black legs and feet. And that is an excellent ID cue for these guys if you get a chance to see their, their legs and their feet. Um, they are very small gull. So they are much smaller than either the ring billed or the herring gull, uh, which are some of the other gulls you might confuse it for. Um, of course, I did say that immature gulls look quite different, and this is particularly true uh, for the black legged kittiwake. Uh, so this is a young, black, a, a recently fledged black legged kittiwake. Um, you, you can see that it doesn't look really that much like the adult, but again, it is quite easy to recognize. Um, so you've got a dark bill, you've got that dark area behind the eye and a black band on the back of the neck. And in flight, the black on the wings actually forms a nice M shape. Uh, so that's very distinctive. And you've got the black tail tip. Um, so those are cues that you can look at to, to tell a, a young black leg kittiwake. Um, it actually takes them three years to reach the full adult plumage, which you saw earlier. Okay, and then we have the black headed gull, um, which, as you can tell from this photo, actually has more of a brown head rather than a black head. Um, but these are also a very distinctive gull, and they're actually common um, in they're common Eurasian gulls. So they're an old world gull, uh, but uh, they do. We know that they winter along the coast of North America, and they actually are a rare breeder here in uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador. So you can find them breeding. Um, specifically on the west coast in the Stephenville area and on small islands off the coast. Um, this guy is a ground nester and it likes to hang out with other gulls in turn. So that's where you'd look for it uh, in, in the breeding season. Um, so these guys are pretty distinct from our other breeding gulls because they do have that brownish black hood. They've got a nice thin red bill and red legs. And if you see them in flight, you can see that they have a white eye arc. So behind their eye, you see that white semicircle. And on the, on the wing, underneath the wing, you can see a white leading wing edge. Okay, and this is a gull that you're probably all familiar with, even if you haven't necessarily known the species name before. This is one that often gets called a seagull. Um, because it's one of our most common widely seen gulls. And it's the gull you're most likely to see away from the coast. So they like to nest inland near freshwater um, and they're opportunistic foragers. So they do eat fish, but they also like insects, rodents and garbage. So this is the gull that you're likely to see at McDonald's. Um, they have a pale eye, as you can see there, and a short yellow bill with a distinctive ring. So it's worth remembering often when you see a species name that birders are not always creative when it comes to naming things. So often you can tell a lot about a bird just from its name. Obviously this is the ring-billed gull. So it tells you right there what one of the major ID cues is. They have a pale gray back um, and two things that you actually can't see in this photo. They have yellow green legs and black wing tips. Black wing tips are pretty common in gulls, but Looking at the color of the legs can tell you a lot. Uh, so for with the ring build, for the ring build gull, remember you've got yellow green legs. Um, and it's also worth mentioning these are all breeding adults, so they've got that clean white head that you can see there. Uh, but non-breeding adults have variable amounts of tan streaking on their heads. So younger gulls tend not to be this clean white color. Okay, and another common gull. Uh, is the herring gull. So here you see the same black wingtips that I was talking about, but notice that the legs are not yellowish green. Uh, so herring gull populations have increased greatly over the last century, um, partly because the species has actually gained legal protection from hunting, but partly because its food source has increased. So this is another gull that likes, it likes human waste. It likes fish and fish herds. Um, and so I, uh, we see quite a lot of them these days. Um, the populations here in Newfoundland 
decreased after the closure of the cod fishery in the early 90s, but they seem to be stable now. Uh, so for these guys, these guys are bigger than the ring-billed gulls, but they do have the same pale eye and a white head, pale gray back, white wingtips, or sorry, black wingtips with white spots, uh, but they have pink legs. So if you're not sure, you can't see whether there's a ring on the bill, you can also look at the, at the leg color. Now, some of you may have noticed that I didn't say anything about what it looks like maybe one of the main ID cues for a herring gull, that red spot on the bill. Um, and I partly didn't mention it because it's actually not that diagnostic. There are many gull species that have that red spot on the bill, but also I am a behavioral ecologist at heart. Uh, I studied the science of animal behavior. I'm kind of a geek for animal behavior. Um, and so I wanted to take a moment to highlight this red spot because it was very important in the birth of the entire field of study of animal behavior. So during the mid 20th century, Nico Tinbergen, who was a Dutch scientist and is currently known as one of the fathers of animal behavior, he noticed that when gull chicks begged food from their parents, they did so by pecking at the red spot on the adults' bills. So he did some experiments where he varied the shape and the coloration of that spot. And what he found out is that that red spot was an essential visual cue uh, to prompt the chick's pecking behavior. Um, and the chick had to peck in order for it to get fed. So that red spot is incredibly important. Uh, and it turns out in 1973, Tinbergen was actually awarded the Nobel Prize in part for this research with gulls. Okay, diversion into animal behavior over, back to identifying gulls. Um, this is our final breeding gull species, and it is the largest gull in the world. Um, it's, it's really got a powerful build, and these guys have an attitude, as you will notice uh, if you encounter them. Um, so it feeds mainly on fish and marine invertebrates, but it will scavenge from other sources. Uh, so not so much garbage, but it does really like the eggs and chicks of other seabirds. So this is a predatory gull. Um, and we do have large breeding colonies of these guys here in Newfoundland, uh, including with, um, in Whitless Bay and on the Hare Bay Islands. Um, once again, this is a species where the name gives you a major cue to its identification, and that is the dark black back. Um, so that, that dark wings and back, that's really the main cue for the great black back gull. Uh, you've got a very large gull with a very heavy bill. You can see that this guy also has a red spot. Um, it's got a red ring around the eye, but that is quite difficult to see unless you are close up. Um, but you've got a really stocky gull with a thick neck. And like the herring gull, you've got pink legs here. Um, so again, remember to look at leg color when you're looking at gulls. This is something that has taken me a while to learn, uh, but you can learn a lot by looking at the leg color. Okay, and we are ready to move on to our final group of seabirds and we are doing great for time um, because we are gonna have lots of time for our little quiz at the end. No pressure, it's a very low key quiz, uh, but it's a fun way to practice some of the uh, information that we've gone over tonight. But before we get there, we're gonna talk about our final group of birds and that is the terns. So we're gonna talk about the three tern species that we find breeding here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, this is a photo of two common terns. Uh, it looks like they are about to get very up close and personal there. Um, so terns overall are very distinctive and particularly if you see a sort of um, very fine, slim billed bird hovering over the water, you're probably looking at a tern. So they have very slender bodies. Um, many of them have that black cap. Common terns have an orange red bill with a dark tip during the breeding season. Uh, they have a, a gray body um, with a darker gray wing tip and a forked tail. Um, and it's really important to notice with these guys that the wing tips and the tail are the same length. So the tail does not extend beyond the wings when they have folded their wings. And this is important to note because our second breeding tern species, the Arctic tern, uh, that is one of the ID cues. So um, in this photo, you can actually see quite, quite clearly that there's some different colorations. So you've got a shorter red bill and shorter red legs, uh, but you've got the same black cap um, and with these guys, they have a longer tail. So they've got a nice long trailing tail, which does extend beyond the tip of their wings. Um, so these are, this is actually one of the pair of species that I find quite difficult to distinguish. Turns are always flying, they're always moving, 
Um, so any cues you can use to tell the difference between the common turn and the Arctic turn are very useful cues to remember. Um, and I did say that I was a behavioral ecologist. I love animal behavior. I love animal movements. So I just want to take a moment to highlight the incredible feats that the Arctic Turn is capable of. These guys are actually known for their yearly migrations. So they breed uh, in the Arctic and then they travel all the way down to Antarctica to winter every year. So birds in North America cover around 40,000 kilometers each year, going back and forth between the Arctic and the Antarctic. Um, and ours aren't even the birds that go the furthest. So in 2013, scientists put trackers on Arctic terns breeding in the Netherlands. And what they, they discovered is they have an even longer migration. So they actually travel across three oceans uh, and they use staging areas. So stops on their migration in the Indian and Southern oceans that we didn't know about and in total, these guys traveled on average 90,000 kilometers during the non-breeding season. So that is the longest bird migration known. And we have a little bit of a map of that here. So those guys, you can see the staging areas where they stop um, in the Indian and the Southern Oceans are shown by those black blotches. And those are the migration paths. So 90,000 kilometers each year. That's pretty remarkable. And the final tern species that we have breeding here is the Caspian tern. Um, and again, you'll see some similarities with that black cap and the orange bill. But Caspian terns are usually pretty easy to tell apart. So first of all, they are our biggest tern by far. They are a large, stocky tern. Uh, they have a black cap and the forehead. And then they have these, this big carrot nose. So if you look at a bird and you think he just looks like a snowman, then it is a Caspian tern. Uh, they also have dark legs and feet, unlike the Arctic and, uh, and common terns. So much larger terns, uh, they've got dark under wing tips. So the, the primaries underneath the wings there, you'll see are quite dark. Um, and then really the main cue is that carrot nose. Caspian terns are very distinct when you do see them in the field. And that brings us all the way through all of our species in good time. Uh, so before we jump into the quiz, does anyone have any questions or anything that they wanted to add, to ask, to share? We do have a couple of questions in the chat, Catherine. Okay, sure. Um, one of them, and I don't know if you know the answer, but I did a little researching while you were talking, was could a herring gull and a ring-billed gull meet for life? With each other, like hybridize? I assume that's the question, probably. Um, I do not know the answer to that. Jenna, do you? From my from my very quick searching on the internet, um, I've discovered that um, yes, well, gulls do hybridize. Um, smaller gulls are not usually the ones that are um, going to hybridize as much as larger gulls. So ring-billed gulls are are smaller. So maybe it wouldn't necessarily, but a herring gull would definitely um, mate with another species. Um, <laughs> and gulls do, in fact, usually mate for life, um, unless they have an unsuccessful brood, in which case they might divorce each other. <laughs> <laughs> that is very cool. I, I don't really think about hybridization in gulls, so that is really neat to know, although I feel that it adds to the level of complexity that you see with gulls, perhaps unnecessarily so. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's another question here. If they winter, uh, this is for Arctic terns. If the mm -hmm. Arctic terns are wintering in Antarctica, does that mean that they're actually in Antarctica during the summer there? Yes, it does. Yeah, that's exactly what it means. So uh, they, they have more sense than to head to Antarctica for the winter. They go there for our winter, um, the Antarctic summer. Mind you, I doubt it's all that warm in Antarctica, even during the middle of our winter. But that's that's where our turns would be right now. or just getting ready to come back to us. And then there's one other question right now, and it's do we have sandwich turns in Newfoundland and Labrador? We do not have them breeding here. Um, Jenna, am I remembering correctly? Did, was there one on the rare bird alert or am I make, making that up? I think there was one. It was maybe last year. There was definitely a sandwich turn around. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, yeah, that, that makes sense. So for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with the Newfoundland rare bird alerts, uh, there, are, there are some amazing birders here on this island. 
that uh, keep track of all of the rarities that come to Newfoundland. And we do get a lot of rarities. So we get things that are blown off course from Europe. We also get things from all of North America. Um, and so there are groups that uh, will post these sightings and share these sightings. Um, and so we, we do get to find out about them. Uh, because we're primarily focused on birds that breed here, we don't often get to go see them, particularly during the breeding season. Um, but yes, I, I do vaguely recall news of a sandwich turn in the area. Perfect. And then another question just popped up in the chat. Um, I would like to learn more about artificial light attraction. Do you have someone I could contact or papers you could recommend? Um, off the top of my head, I don't have papers that I would uh, that I can recommend, but I would suggest, um, first of all, I would suggest talking out, uh, checking out those two talks that I mentioned um, on our website. So if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, we have some bird research talks from last fall. Uh, and the one by Laura Tranquilla mentions the light attraction and one by Sydney Collins is almost entirely about light attraction. And it's Sydney that I would actually probably direct you to. Um, as one of the experts on light attraction here in, in Newfoundland. You could also um, talk to Bill Montevecchi, who I believe is her PhD supervisor and has done some work on light attraction. Um, and I mentioned in the chat that we can send out the link to our website that has um, those videos available. So um, if you can't Absolutely. find them, we will send those out to you in a follow-up. Um, and then somebody, uh, Scott is asking for the rare bird alerts, where would people, or where do the finders post to this information? Uh, so one of the, uh, one of the first places it gets posted is the nf.birds Google group, which you can join. Um, there is also a WhatsApp group, which is administered by Alvin Buckley. Um, and I'm not quite sure how you go about joining that WhatsApp group. Um, probably by contacting Alvin Buckley, who is one of our regional coordinators. Uh, so you could actually reach out to him uh, through our website. His contact information would be on our website under regional coordinators. Um, there is also, if you're interested in using um, Discord, which is a online platform, oh, yes. there's an Atlantic birding Discord channel that also has rare birds posted in there. So there's a few different avenues for that. <laughs> okay, um, that's all the questions um, for now. Uh, okay. We'll see if any others pop up, but we could save them all for right. the end. Well, let's give our quiz a try. Like I said, very low pressure situation. It's just for fun, uh, but it's kind of, kind of fun to practice what you've learned tonight. Uh, so I have five questions. And when I start the poll, unfortunately all five um, questions are going to pop up at once, but we're going to go through the uh, the pictures one at a time. So first, just answer um, answer for the first species and ignore the rest of the questions. So we're going to start with this guy. What is this guy? Uh, and if the picture is being covered by the pole, uh, you can move the pole over. So just grab it and pull it over. You can go ahead and submit your answers here. I'm not getting any answers. Oh, um, somebody in the chat is saying that they can't submit unless they answer all the questions. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. Okay, well, we'll just go through them and you can answer them. Uh, mm, this is tricky. Okay, huh, huh. All right, we might have to do this without a poll tonight. You know what, we're gonna do it without a poll because as soon as I move on, you're all gonna see the answer. So let's <laughs> have you put your answers into the chat. Let's see it in the chat. We're gonna, we're gonna go with it. So what have we got here? I see common mer. does everyone agree? Anyone think anything different from common myrrh? We've got a razor bill. Got a thick billed myrrh. Okay. Black guillemot. Thick billed myrrh. Okay. So 
These are all very good guesses. Um, I'd say the two most common are the common myrrh and the thick build myrrh. Uh, this actually is a common myrrh. So those of you who said common myrrh, you are correct. Um, it is hard to tell. So common and thick build are quite difficult to distinguish, but remember that the thick build have that milk mustache uh, and you don't see any white line on this MERS bill. Um, it's not bridled, so that would have been an easy giveaway. So that, that makes things a little bit harder. The other main difference you can remember is that when you're looking at where the white meets the black on a thick build MERS uh, breast and, and belly, you'll see a, a sharp point for thick build MER, whereas for common MER, you see that nice curve. Um, black guillemot, black guillemot, you would see a black breast and belly. Um, you cannot see the legs in this one, so that useful red leg IDQ I gave you is admittedly not particularly useful here. Um, and I forget what the other, somebody said something that I've missed, but I cannot, oh, razor bill. Um, so razor bill, much like the thick build myrrh, you would expect to see white on the bill, but for the razor bill, you would expect to see uh, a, um, a white line, a white vertical line at the tip of the bill, and then a white line from the base of the bill to the eye. All right, what about this one? And if people want to see some suggestions for answers, I can launch the poll again briefly, just so that, uh, so this is question two. You can see the, the possible answers there. Put your answers in the chat. Maybe just pop up the poll yep, again, just I for got it. options, yeah. Yep. You should be able to see it now, right, Jenna? Yes, um, if people want to see number two, you can scroll down on your poll yeah. that's popped up for you. I'm getting shag, yep. Everyone seems to be agreed that this is a cormorant, and almost everybody is saying double-crested cormorant. Um, and this is indeed true. So uh, remember the main difference that you're looking for in a great cormorant is a very white uh, throat there. Now, admittedly, this guy is not as dark as, um, as a you know, breeding adult uh, double-crested cormorant, but he doesn't have that clear white patch on the throat. Okay, so let's see. Uh, there's a double-crested cormorant. All right, we just have three more. All right, so which species is this? And you should be able to scroll down to question number three and see uh, our options there. So answers in the uh, chat again. Okay, well, everybody seems to be agreed that this is a common term. Uh, so, or sorry, everybody seems to be agreed that this is a turn. Uh, I'm getting both common and Arctic. Uh, you are correct that this, this is a turn, and I'm not seeing anybody put Caspian. Uh, so great job. No carrot nose on this guy. Uh, this, in fact, is an Arctic turn. Does anybody want to, if anybody wants to just unmute themselves and tell me why they think it's an Arctic and not a common? Okay, I've seen long tail, absolutely. So if you look at the wing tips versus the end of the tail, the tail actually does stretch just past the wing tips there. You can see it best on the back wing tip. Uh, short legs, yep. Long Shorter pointy. Legs. Sorry? Bill. Can you repeat that? Long pointed red bill. Red bill, long pointed red bill, absolutely, yeah. Uh, and the legs are red as well, so well done. All right, and what about this guy? Again, scroll down. Um, what is this guy? You scroll down, you can see question number four there. I see just one person is, oh, okay. Okay, just about everyone's agreeing on this one. Um, great job. This is, in fact, a black-legged kitty wake. Uh, a little bit tricky because you can't actually see the leg color on this guy. And a couple people did say ring-billed gull, uh, but there is no obvious ring on the gull's bill here. Um, and you've just you've got that very light gray back, and uh, just the tip tip of the wings are black. 
Um, so yeah, it would definitely be more useful if it were in fact standing up and you can see its black legs. Um, something else that's kind of useful though is uh, black legged kittiwakes do nest on cliffs and, and you can see that this guy is uh, quite clearly against the edge of a cliff there. So that can be useful too. Context, often very useful. All right, and one more here. So scroll, if you scroll right down to the bottom of the quiz, we'll do the polls better next week. Sorry about the difficulty. What do we have here? One last species. Oh, people can answer this one. And the, the poll. And this one is a trickier one based on what I'm seeing on the poll and in the chat. Okay, we now seem to be leaning in one direction. Um, so most people seem to think that this is a Northern Fulmer and it is, you are correct. Um, so the tricky part here, uh, it, so it does have that dark black back, which is very characteristic of a black back gull and it is a large stocky bird. Um, again, very characteristic of a great black back gull. Um, but if you look at the, the bill on this, you can see that little tube nose, and that's probably your best ID characteristic. So remember, fulmers are the prosoleriforms, they have those tube noses, and gulls do not. So that is a main difference there. Okay, well, apologies again that our poll didn't uh, work out there, but yep, I see that lots of people are, are observing because of the, the uh, tube nose. So thank you for participating. Um, and that is it for tonight. I'll just leave you with some resources and we will also include these in the follow-up email that we send to everybody. Um, so these are just, uh, if you are looking for lists of the birds of Newfoundland, um, you can check out Nature NL's website. They actually have a checklist of these birds that you can purchase for something like $2. Um, and Bird the Rock, which is a, our, one of our local birding tourism groups, uh, led by an amazing birder, Jared Clark. He has an unofficial checklist of the birds of Newfoundland on his website. Um, and finally, I will end just by putting up our contact information. Uh, so that is our website. As Jenna said, we will send you the link to find that um, those talks about the light attraction from the fall. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, you can email us at nlatlas at birdscanada.org. And I'll just uh, close by reminding you that we will be back next week with another webinar. Jenna will be telling us all about ducks and loons and it will be awesome. So I hope that we see some of you next week. Thank you very much for joining us tonight.